Hi, I'm James Naila Green, Professor of Brazilian History and Culture at Brown University and the National Co-Coordinator of the U.S. Network for Democracy in Brazil. This program is supported by the Washington Brazil Office. This is Brazil Unfiltered. Today I have the pleasure of interviewing Marcos Arruda, who is largely responsible for my five decades of work on Brazil, starting when I met him in early 1973 in Washington, D.C., and he invited me to work with the Commission Against Repression in Brazil. Marcus is a geologist, economist, popular educator, writer, poet, and important reference in debates about democracy, human rights, education, and democracy. As a student of geology in the early 1960s, he was active in the student movement. Marcus moved to Sao Paulo in the late 1960s as part of an effort by many young radicals to work in a factory and build opposition to the military regime. Arrested in 1970 where he, uh, and brutally tortured, Marcos went into exile in 1971, where he was one of the principal organizers of the campaign in the United States to denounce the Brazilian dictatorship and the gross violation of human rights occurring in the country. His story is captured in a book, A Mother's Cry, a memoir of politics, prison, and torture under the Brazilian military regime, published by Duke University Press in 2010, which was written by his mother, Lina Pena Santamini, with an introduction by yours truly, and a powerful epilogue written by Marcus about his experiences in prison and in exile. I encourage listeners to get a copy. A Mother's Cry is the title. Marcus has a long and illustrious life working tirelessly for social justice, and it would take the entire program to list all of his books, articles, and the many, many contributions to transforming the world as a participant in dozens of organizations, coalitions, and networks. Today, however, we will approach the 60th anniversary of the military coup in Brazil that took place on March 3rd, 31st, April 1st, 1964, and we want to talk to him about this period in Brazilian history. Marcos, welcome to Brazil Unfiltered. I'm very honored and proud of you, dear Jim, for your invita the invitation to sh share with you the valuable space of Brazil Unfiltered and the Washington Brazil office. Thank you, Mark. Your initiatives reveal the truth about Brazil and the U.S. interventions in our internal affairs. These are invaluable and deserve all our support. So, Marcos, in 1961, you entered the university to become a geologist. And the next year, you were elected president of the National Association of Geology Students, which was affiliated to the National Union of Students. Could you briefly tell us your process of politicalization that you went through during this period before the 1964 military coup? Okay. I, I was born in a politically conservative family, as you know. And uh, it took me to go to the School of Geology at the University of Brazil at the time, Federal University. Um, and began participating in the University Catholic Youth Movement to become uh, aware that poverty and social inequalities are not a fate of life. Um, I realized little by little, and sometimes very fast because of the co context we were living, uh, that the economy was not uh, something uh, that could benefit the majority because our capitalism, especially in Brazil, is an economy of scarcity and exclusion for the majority. And the system needs poverty to perpetuate oppressive relations between social classes. Uh, in my mandate as National Secretary of Geology Students, um, I uh, defined together with the other directors uh, our purpose to raise awareness about Brazil's need to defend its national sovereignty over our mineral resources. And that led us to do research and mobilize students of geology around a, 
an active agenda. Uh, my, uh, we helped create a mining policy group in 63. Uh, we helped organize a conference which was called Or D Does Not Yield Two Harvests, uh, meaning by that it's not like agricultural products, um, mines, and minerals do not reproduce easily by no means. And that was two months before the coup, this conference. There were, it was important because it brought many politicians and uh, labor leaders together to discuss mining policy and to affirm the need for sovereignty over those uh, the, that wealth underground. And in that conference, the uh, idea of the creation of Minerobras was launched. It would be a sort of Petrobras, the oil company of Brazil, which has existed since 1954. Um, However, we also were dealing with the powerful interests uh, of in the mining sector in particular. And I would mention Hanna Mining Company and a few others like Bethlehem Steel, United States Steel, all of which were exploiting our mineral wealth. And we were raising the issue and uh, reinforcing the opposition of Vale do Rio Doce, which was a very important company at the time. And it was a state company who was also opposed to, uh, to privatize and transnationalize our mineral wealth. Uh, I focus especially on Hena because of the uh, types of people involved. John McCloy, for example, was a uh, formerly president of the World Bank and a key figure of HANA. And uh, he was also chairman of Chase Manhattan Bank and a partner of Rockefeller in a law firm, um, and he is the person who brought Lincoln Gordon, the ambassador of the US in Brazil, who was the key figure in uh, plotting the coup with Brazilian leaders, military and uh, corporate leaders. He brought Lincoln Gordon to Castelo Branco, the first dictator. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> McCloy told him, restoring concessions of mining uh, for Hena and our subsidiaries might be a condition for receiving US economic assistance. So that to give you an idea of how, how powerful foreign interests were at the time and uh, how much they benefited from the coup. Uh, just to say that in the space of my school, I was raising these issues of national sovereignty and the need to uh, nationalize our mineral wealth. And the director of the school spread the slander that I was a communist. My feeling is that I was just following the example of Jesus and fighting for justice and against poverty. Mark, you had a you, your family. Your grandmother was very religious. You were raised in a very Catholic family. Your father did social work. I know in the poor neighborhoods of, of Rio de Janeiro. You were even a seminarian student. Um, but what what changed? What what were the factors that led you to become involved in the left uh, specifically? Besides the issues around um, uh, mineral wealth being in the hands of the of Brazilian people and not in foreign companies. What was that process like for you? Yeah, 
uh, we lived near a favela, Santa Marta, and the, some of the maids working in our house came from there. We had two maids, and uh, it was shocking to see the conditions of life of these people. That was one factor. The other was, as I said, becoming a, a university student and joining the Catholic youth, which was at the time a very socially oriented organization. And uh, then the, the Brazilian context included the election of Jânio Quadros. I was, it was my first election and I voted for him, of course, coming from the family I had. And uh, uh, one year later, I was already confronted with his uh, um, renunciation and uh, the first attempt at a coup d'etat that happened at the time, and it was General Lott, the one who uh, uh, defended uh, the, the law and the constitution and hindered that coup from happening. And uh, here comes Jean Goulart. Uh, I had to confront my family because Jean Goulart was seen as communist by them as well. And I realized, wait a minute, what is communism after all? <laughs> and then I began reading and uh, studying about it and trying to understand how much I was being deceived by tradition. And uh, with all these factors, I ended up marching in the streets in favor of democracy and legality and against a coup and from there onward, that's how it happened, my friend. Marcus, you were in Rio when the coup happened on March 31st, April 1st, 1964. I think you've mentioned in other places that you actually saw uh, the burning of the National Union of Students, which was in a building uh, in Rio de Janeiro. Could you describe a little bit what was the atmosphere around the moment of the coup and what you, what you, how you responded, what you were thinking and feeling? Well, on March, March 13, there was this impressive uh, gathering with Jean Goulart in Central do Brasil. And I was one of those who went to that speech, you know. And I felt the mobilization of working people, trade unions, peasants. Everybody was there and part of the middle class as well. And so there was this momentum in favor of a basic set of reforms that would cover a number of areas of life of the country, like agrarian reform, uh, school reform, university reform, mining reform. And so we were involved in preparing proposals for these reforms. I was um, in the UNI, uh, National Union of Students, uh, national meeting in 63, and I was writing ideas for the university reform and proposing ideas to support the peasants with the grand reform, education of peasants, all these things that really would make a tremendous difference. And when the coup happened, these all fell down, you know, and nothing could per be pursued from then on. Do you so remember that's... what you heard? Do you remember what happened that day? Someone called you? Someone came out of your house? What happened? No, no, I was, uh, I, I, I went downtown when I heard that there was resistance. And uh, first of all, we were all gathered at UNI, but then we learned from someone that uh, a massive number of students of uh, a conservative university was coming to UNI to attack us. So we all moved to the School of Engineering, 
in the square San Francisco. And uh, we went to the upper floor and some military uh, Marines uh, who were nationalists came with some guns to teach us how to shoot and all that until nothing, nothing happened before somebody came saying, we just heard that Brizola is no longer going to resist and uh, we have to demobilize. At that point- So at that time was the brother-in-law of Juan Goulart, who in yeah. 1961 had resisted attempts not to allow Goulart to take the presidency. But at this point, he and his brother-in-law evaluated that it, it wasn't going to be possible to resist the military in power. So they didn't do that. They didn't call people to resist, correct? That's right. That's correct. And there, at that moment, I, I took a bus back home and uh, the bus went in front of the Uni in Praia de Botafogo, uh, do Flamengo. And I, I saw them uh, throwing our furniture th from the veranda and, and putting uh, fire to, to the building. It was a very sad uh, view that I had. And from that moment on, I had to prepare some weeks, a couple of weeks underground until I was sure I was not going to be persecuted and went back to class. And then in, so, and later in the 60s, uh, the student movement, which was really crushed in the first moments of the coup, will reorganize in the universities and start mobilizing again. But you make a decision to move from Rio to Sao Paulo and to work in a factory. Could you talk a little bit about that process and why you made that decision during the dictatorship to leave a middle-class lifestyle with a middle-class family and go to Sao Paulo and, and work in a factory with people receiving or earning the minimum wage? What was that? What was your plan? What was your idea to do that? Yes. First of all, I was... Uh, a, a student leader for all those years, and my name was, was quite well known uh, at the time in the area of geology, which means they were sabotaging any possibility of me getting a job in Rio. And uh, I was first employed in Petropolis at uh, a uh, aerial photographic um firm that would do mappings using fo aerial photographs as the tool. And I spent one year working in that for my pleasure. I loved my profession. And then I went back to Rio and I was laid off also in Petropolis. And in Rio, I got an unofficial position in one of the uh, uh, federal departments that dealt with sanitation. And uh, at the same time, I continued doing liter literacy for workers um, using Paulo Freire's approach and also organizing intellectuals in the struggle for democracy um, with some other colleagues of Ação Popular. That was our organization. Which and, would be translated uh, into English to being popular action. Right? Popular action, mm -hmm. thank you. And, uh, well, at one point, the police went to my house, to my father's house. I, I, I was living elsewhere. And when I learned that they were looking for me, I packed and went to Sao Paulo and started a new life there and uh, taught geosciences and uh, did some work to earn a, my living until I decided to go to a factory and become a worker to help organize the workers and uh, educate and so on. And at that point, I began understanding how much I had to learn from the workers. I went into a factory called Sofungi, 
It was a uh, foundry uh, belonging to Mercedes-Benz, a subsidiary of Mercedes. The conditions of work were horrible. We had uh, 12 hours a day, six hours a, a week of uh, uh, work, and many, many times, very often, um, extra work for hours each day, 14, 15 hours working. And uh, it was really unbelievable that in a city like Sao Paulo, the biggest in Latin America, uh, there were conditions of work like that. So, Marcos, how much would a worker in today's dollar term, just generally, be earning a month? If you were working in this factory, what would you be taking home a month in today's dollars? Could you guess? Just approximately. Yes. I would say I was earning um, $80 a month. Um, I had, just to give you a better idea, uh, in the end of the second week, beginning of the third week, I had no more money to pay the bus to go to work. So I would have to wake up one hour earlier with a colleague who lived nearby in a worker's district. And we walked one hour to, to the factory to be there at five to six by the machine ready ready to put it to work when the sound, the bus to the, the bell sounded to start working. So- In other words, you weren't even earning enough to be able to, to live for a month, working six days no, a week, 12 right. hours a day. Yes, that's right. So we relied on extra work to earn a little more. They paid, but it was still in, not enough. You know, so after a few months, I was ill with a, a spot in my lung and I had to be treated. And the, the doctor knew, the uh, factory doctor, that I could not stop working. So he told the company in a letter that I had to stop working over time and I should work only eight hours and a half a day as the law said. And uh, a few days later, I was um, laid off. Uh, I went to talk with the uh, supervisor and asked, what's happening? You're not happy with my work? He said, no, no, you are a good worker, but uh, we can't uh, take you because you're not working as long as we need. And I said, but uh, if I'm ill, it's because of this work of this company. Uh, are you going to uh, lay me off because I'm ill? And he said, look outside the line of people waiting to be employed under any conditions. You have no more space here, Marcus. Wow. And Marcus, so, how did you end up getting arrested? You got arrested in 1970. Could you tell our listeners, our viewers, a little bit about that story? It's a very dramatic story that uh, your mother recounts in the book, A Mother's Cry. Tell us a little about that. Yes. <clears throat> well, in 69, uh, Medici became the president. And uh, Institutional Act Number Five was passed, uh, uh, which really tightened the uh, the bolts of the, the system in a way that there was a wave of arrests and torture became official under Medici, and then was pursued during Geisel as well, the other general who came after Medici. Uh, at the time, then, I was a worker in the factory and in the trade union, active in the opposition, trade union opposition. And uh, at that moment, I was supposed to find a place for this woman, Marlene, to move because she belonged to a, a, an armed struggle organization 
which I did not know, but I knew that she was in need. And I went to meet her to say, I'm still looking for another place for you to move. And at the time she was already arrested and tortured. So they caught me at the time. She had been in the student movement and was working in this organization connected to the armed struggle. She had to find a place to hide. She met with you, asked you to help her out. And when you came back to, to talk to her again, she had already been arrested and she um, mentioned to the police that she was going to meet you. They took her to that spot. She identified you and then you were arrested. Is that how it happened? Yeah, just with an important detail. She had been tortured during hours and her hand, hands were swollen and black and uh, she could not hold anymore. So she took the police to the meeting with me and that's how I was arrested. But she was in horrible shape after that. And uh, when we finally were able to talk, which was an adventure, uh, she was telling me how horribly she she felt and how guilty and all that. And I was trying to tell her that uh, she should relax. I, I had nothing against her. <clears throat> I don't know what happens when we are tortured. I was tortured just in one very long session, which led me to <clears throat> almost die, receive the oils and all that. But what would I do if the torture remained for weeks and months as it did to other people, many of whom I know? Uh, so don't feel guilty and go ahead, I bless you and so on. <clears throat> so that's how I got arrested. And after that, I never saw her until years later uh, when both of us were already free. Our listeners should know that torture meant electric shocks, beatings, and all sorts of horrible practices on our bodies and minds. And it is a situation of terror. And we began understanding what the meaning of uh, state terrorism is. And this is what we lived in those years. It was really a horrible thing that we don't want to repeat it in our history. Marcos, when you're finished, family learned about the fact that you were in prison. What did they do to try to find you and get you out of jail? What did they do? Oh, well, my family got mobilized. First, my grandma, who lived in Rio, and then she communicated with my mother, her daughter, who lived in the U.S. and worked as an interpreter. And uh, my mother began contacting the churches and then gradually being helped to contact congressmen and uh, uh, the media. Um, and uh, they also tried to meet the generals responsible for prisons in Rio, in Sao Paulo, because I lived in Sao Paulo and later in Rio. All these things were very important. My mother mobilized Amnesty International in the U.S., who wrote letters that were very uh, complicated for the military to answer because the military uh, attributed um, convulsions that I had to epilepsy, and I was never ill with epilepsy. So my mother was gathering uh, testimonies of people who knew me, my colleagues uh, in geology uh, who raised the point. Marcus could never be a geologist working in the woods in the countryside if he had the, suffered the risk of epileptic attacks. This would never happen and so on. So. All these things together created an image that <clears throat> I was a very uncomfortable 
uh, prisoner for the military. But I was so um, handicapped by torture that they could not release me in those conditions. So they were trying to treat me with physiotherapy and uh, uh, all sorts of uh, pills that they gave me until I could finally uh, leave the prison. I was transferred to Rio. That was a relief. <clears throat> and here in Rio, I was um, continued my treatment and, and uh, spent most of the time in the hospital, military hospital, was interviewed by a general who was a doctor, according to his outfit and language. And uh, when he asked what I was doing in the military hospital, I said I was tortured. And he made a big fuss saying I was lying. There is no torture in Brazil and blah, blah. And then he said, put him in water and bread for a few days and he will. And so they took me back to the torture center, but did not torture me. Uh, just uh, stayed there for three nights, hearing the torture of other prisoners, the shouting during night, the night, including the night of Christmas, December 24th. And finally, I had another convulsion and was taken back to the hospital. And only a month and a half later, I was released. Marcos, this is not in the list. It's a new question. Marcos, do you know who the people were that tortured you? Do you know their names? Yes, I, I gave those names to the Pope. When I wrote a letter to Pope Paul VI, uh, giving details of all that I went through, and in the letter I put down the names of captains who led the, the teams that arrested people and tortured us. And in that case, it was Operação Bandeirantes. It was an underground um, organization specialized in arresting and torturing and killing people. And it was uh, led, staffed by army police and fire department. In Brazil, we have militarized fire departments and funded by transnational corporations like Nestle, Ford, General Motors, General Electric, Mercedes-Benz, Siemens, Ultragas, all of these funded this unofficial uh, torture center. And uh, also the army colonel that was a leader, uh, Colonel Coelho, uh, I gave his name as well when I wrote a letter to the Pope. Were any of these people ever brought to justice in Brazil and put in prison for having committed gross violations of human rights officially as members of the state, the state actors? They should have, but no, I never heard of any being even tried, much less punished for what crimes they did, you know. Marcos, you left Brazil. Your family heard that you were going to be rearrested, and so you left Brazil, went to the United States where your mother was living and working. Tell us a little about the work you did in the United States to build solidarity with the opposition to the dictatorship in Brazil. Okay, Jim. Um, well, I have spent a couple of months very depressed for having to leave Brazil, even though in the States I had already been for one year as a, an exchange student. But uh, it took me a uh, deep uh, depression to decide, uh, helped by my mother, that I had to find a, another meaning for my life. Otherwise, I would end up ill. And, and that's when I said, well, since I'm here, Let's see what we can do to help Brazilian, the Brazilian people instead of just uh, lamenting my, my condition. 
And that's when we created me and a number of American people, um, uh, American persons who showed incredible solidarity with us. Uh, the Committee Against Repression in Brazil, Carib, in 1972. You, Jim, were one of our supporters following that in the following year and on. Policy of um, following the Brazilian government uh, actions, one of which was pre they prepared the visit of General Medici the dictator at the time, it was 1971, uh, to visit Nixon and Kissinger and uh, with the uh, theater group and a number of other people of uh, churches in Washington, D.C. Uh, and sympathetic other people uh, received medicine uh, with uh, masks of the Brazilian flag on our face, on their faces. Uh, I could not be there. I had to get away because I was forbidden to do any political activity in the States. Uh, but uh, all the others did that, and it was really impressive. Even the, the media covered that. I think it was a new the Washington Post that carried the photograph uh, taken uh, on the veranda of the White House uh, from where, where uh, Kissinger and, and uh, Nixon were going to have breakfast with Madison. But the picture showed outside the fence of, of the White House a big sign um, that could be read saying, stop US dollar complicity with Brazilian torture. So it, it, it went quite far, you know, that uh, demonstration. And also there was a campaign to release one of the main uh, peasant leaders in Brazil, Manuel da Conceição, and you, Jim, were part of that effort, uh, and uh, I also was invited by Amnesty International to make a tour in California uh, and speak to a number of audiences about what was happening in Brazil, even to prisoners in uh, St. Quentin prison oh. off the coast of California. And uh, talking to Congress people and uh, trying to oppose the policy of supporting the coup in Brazil with financial weapons, military aid, all sorts, denouncing the School of the Americas who was training officials and police of our countries in Latin America on how to organize a coup and how to maltreat their prisoners. All these things were part of our agenda. But well, I, no, I would on. like to emphasize two other things mm -hmm. that we learned from, from that experience in the early exile for me. One was how grateful I felt for each and every one of you who uh, showed so much solidarity with our struggle. You and Harry uh, Straharsky, Loretta, Phil Wheaton, and others who gave so much of your energy and time to defend the peoples of the South from the greed of the empire, US empire in our continent. And second, uh, my fantastic uh, discovery of Latin America in the United States as I met other Latin Americans, some of whom were victims of coup d'etat and were refugees 
and we gathered together in 73 when the Chilean coup happened. We, we converted Carib into COFLA, which was a committee for the freedom of Latin American peoples. And uh, we made an extensive campaign against the coup, the Pinochet coup in Chile. All these things uh, came out of, of, of the support that Americans were giving to our struggle. Marcos, um, President Lula recently issued an order to cancel any officially planned events to mark the 60th anniversary of the coup, arguing that it's time to turn the page and avoid debates that might upset or alarm the military. Although civil society and human rights organizations have organized many activities around this state to remember the consequences of the military coup of 1964, how do you understand Lula's decree? <clears throat> Well, let me begin the, to answer you by underlying, underlining the very important transformation Lula went through over these recent years. Uh, I admire him very much for what he did. The fact that he resisted uh, his own colleagues in the trade unions and the Workers' Party arguing that he should leave the country before he was arrested. And he said, I'm not leaving. I have nothing to fear. I'm staying. If they arrest me, I will go to prison, but I have to prove my innocence and nobody will take this right from me. That was a very impressive uh, show of courage. And uh, it showed that during the 581 days in prison, he received a number of very uh, committed persons uh, of all sorts and uh, origins, including Leonardo Boff, for example, the theologist of liberation, the most well-known from Brazil. And uh, Lula really went through a deep change in his heart. And I, I uh, think he has a project for Brazil that is um, much more advanced than his government. The government is pulling him backwards and that is a shame. So I say there are virtues in his presidency and there are shortcomings one of which was this decision he took, which is a shame. It proves that governability is more valued than any other uh, quality, which is a shame. The phrase, turn the page of history, is horrible, horrible because it reminds us of Fernando Henrique Cardoso, who said pretty much the same thing in as a coward and uh, i think it comes out of fear of the military lula is being pressured by the military military are being uh, indicted for having been involved in the coup attempt in january 22 and uh, of course the three armed forces are uh, are fearing on their part being punished and having to go lose their graduations and having to to lose faith and all that but uh, what is said Jim is that to hide the truth facilitates the possibility of other coups um we we had the 64 coup that we are now um, in quotes celebrating or <laughs> critically. Um, and that was a, a warfare with weapons in the streets, tanks and all that. But other forms of coup came after like lawfare, which is called. And uh, uh, the fact that we did not uh, opened the Pandora box uh, in 60, 
when the, the dictatorship ended in 1985 on uh, has allowed the right wing to reorganize and attempt a coup last year or rather in 22 and last year or early last year no um i am sorry that i hear lula take this position and i just hope that the government will have the courage to pressure the military to open up documents that are secret. Uh, I think our very brave colleague, Peter Topcornblow, uh, made a list of initiatives that could be taken of people in Brazil and the US pressuring our governments to uh, uh, open the secret documents. It's more than time for that. And I would like to end with this comment about Lula, that Lula, in order to face the pressure of the military, the only possibility he had was to mobilize the population who voted for him. We were the majority. We won the election last year. And uh, it, it would be the means to resist and to take bolder positions like uh, say no to any coups that may still be in the agenda of the right and the extreme right. Lula is lacking this kind of connection with the majority of his supporters. And that is very serious, a problem of communication and lack of mobilization of people for a progressive set of reforms that will give Brazil the right to a more just and uh, uh, fair uh, present, not only future, but present. Marcos, uh, unfortunately, be. our time is running out. And quite honestly, I think I could do a six part series on your lifetime contributions to social justice, human rights in Brazil and around the world. I wanna thank you so much for joining us today for Brazil Unfiltered. So do I, my friend, thank you very much. And I will be publicizing as much as possible all the great work you're doing in Brazil and in the United States Count on us and win our uh, our grateful support. I hope you enjoy the interview today. If you are watching on YouTube, don't forget to like the video. And if you have not yet subscribed, please do so. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcast, please give us a five-star review. It helps other people find the program. Have a great week. Until next time, até a próxima.